The record courier graciously wrote several stories on the bar. Well, all this led to a dairy exhibit and the Smithsonian Barn Again! exclamation point exhibit. Irene and Ellen drove to Elko to help their museum set up the Smithsonian exhibit since it wasn't quite as easy as they had been led to believe. Leola Anderson Tucker, Marlena Helwinkle, and Ellen collaborated on a book of all the barns remaining in the Carson Valley, published in 2003. Ellen was the typist and states, thank heaven for computers. After this, the celebration of the 125th anniversary began for the town of Minden. She says, it was at that point that I stepped away from the museum and the exhibit committee. I don't remember what it was that was so all fired important, but whatever it was, I left and I did it. When she returned to the Historical Society, Lois Thran urged her to write a poem in the record courier as her cousin Frida Verdigny had done in the 1970s. Can I say that? They took a sample column to the editor, Kurt Gilbrand. He agreed to include the column in the museum's Main Street Moments, and it was launched on Friday, July 6, 2007. It has appeared there ever since, every Friday ever since. Over the years, the column has given important information about museum exhibits and events, sponsored contests, and given the community an awareness of the rich cultural history in Douglas County. Here are a few of, other, of, of Ellen's other contributions in Douglas County. Mistress of ceremonies for the secondhand rose luncheon and fashion shows. Of course, Switch, the master of lights for the annual melodrama, starting with Whistle Stop 3. Two summer melodramas at the Daybrook Home Ranch Historic Park. But she wasn't switched there because these shows are in the daytime. But she did keep us all going in and off the stage on a hot time. She has been a leader of Bible studies as a member of her church, Trinity Lutheran, as an, and is a commissioned Stephen minister with training to come alongside women going through life-changing trials, such as death and love. She served as president and vice president of the Carson Valley Literary Club and as co-founder of the Never Give Up Crochet Group. Ellen made large numbers of chemo caps and toilet which were donated to the Carson Tau Cancer Center for patients to brighten their days during treatment and hospitalization. She continued many, she contributed many ornaments for the group's crochet tree during the museum's gallery of trees this year, as well as sharing and creating a crochet gingerbread house, which was donated to the museum as a silent auction item. She's a steadfast inspiration to all of us who love to crochet. I especially love our shopping trips to the army stores. <laughs> Ellen has told me that it has been her pleasure to be a part of this wonderful community for the last 20 years, and wants to thank Irene Marshall for encouraging her to join the Douglas County Historical Society. Thank you.
person that I'm honoring, her family is not here. I was hoping the last minute they might still show up. Uh, her brother is 94 years old, so there might be some health issues that he just, they felt they couldn't make it today. So I'll go ahead and do the best I can without their moral support here in the front row. Ruth Georgia Felton came to Gardnerville, Nevada from Baldwin, North Dakota at an early age. Her father, the Reverend Paul H. Felton, accepted the call to become pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church, the first Lutheran church in Nevada. So in 1921, he and his wife, Willie, and the nine surviving of 11 children came to Gardnerville, Nevada. The siblings were Ruth, Eleanor, Lily, Edith, Roland, Herbert, Carl, Jean, and Harold. And Harold is the only surviving sibling. They lived in the parsonage next to the church that was located on what now is State Route 756, or Centerville Lane, south of Gardnerville, and by what is now called the Lutheran Bridge. Ruth was not only the oldest sibling, but she was very intelligent, according to her brother, Harold. She entered Douglas County High School, right here, at the age of 12, and graduated in 1925, and then attended Harold's Business College in Oakland, California, for a year. It was in 1925 that a Henner's pipe organ was acquired by the church. A self-taught organist, Ruth soon became the main source of music for the church services and the choir. A, for a person that was only not even five feet tall, I often marveled at her ability to play that big organ. Ruth played the piano for the Minden Rotary Club for every meeting that they had and other community functions. In addition to her talent at the organ and the piano, she also touched many young lives throughout Carson Valley as a Sunday school teacher for many years. In addition to her devotion to her church, Ruth also devoted, was also devoted to other youths of Carson Valley through her teaching in the 4-H clothing program. Her teaching of garment construction was known throughout the state of Nevada. Many of her 4-Hers went on to win statewide sewing contests, awarding them the prestigious trip to Chicago. If you're a 4-H member, you know what that trip to Chicago meant. During an interview with one of her winning 4-Hers, I was told, if a seam was crooked or a stitch out of place, it had to be ripped out and done over to, protect, to perfection. The club members would meet in her home in the morning and then be served lunch before they went home. In later years, the meetings were held in the home economics room here in the high school. In 1943, due to World War II, State 4-H camp was only held for two days up at Lake Tahoe. Homemakers clubs from Douglas and Lyon County sponsored and prepared meals for the campers. Ruth was one of those willing volunteers. A 1951 article in the newspaper states that Ruth was awarded her 10-year pin as a 4-H leader. Text in the article says, and I quote, all of the clothing and dress review winners have scored their successes under the direction of Ms. Ruth Belton, who has served as a 4-H club leader in clothing and dress review for the past 10 years, unquote. And I'm sure she even continued her leadership for a few more years after that. Her father retired in 1955, and Ruth and her parents had moved to Pacifica, California, where Ruth died in May of 1990. Among her hobbies were photography, reading, and sewing. Ruth was not only my Sunday school teacher, my choir director, my 4-H leader, but she was also my godmother. I fondly called her Tanta Ruth, Tanta meaning aunt. I still have three special dolls with complete wardrobes 
the Tantra booths, so, and you'll see them over there on the display table. She uh, did a complete wardrobe for each of them, including hats, coats, dresses, formal wear, knitted sweaters, and even little leather shoes. It is with fond memories and much love that I present Ruth Felton as an honoree for the 2015 Women in History Remembering Project of the Douglas County Historical Society. Thank you. Usually. 
easily in a rock or cement trough. The shaded water of the river was always cold. A, wet, a relative remembers going to the spring house in the summer for a bottle of Coca-Cola. It was so cold, she said, it made your teeth hurt. <laughs> later, she found, this same relative found a bottle of peaches, much later, marked 1913. She didn't eat them, she just wanted the bottles. <laughs> the wash house was next to the spring house. The clothes were washed there and hung on the line to dry. The candy shop was still a going concern. Tickets to the movies at the Valhalla Theater were sold by Martha in advance, perhaps a prophecy of things to come. Another ad in the newspaper makes the offer of ordering flowers for Decoration Day and other special occasions. Florence was the artistic one, and she is known to have arranged flowers and made corsages. Much later, Florence had the flower business from their home. She was also a notary public. And her stamp is one of the things in the display over here. In about 1919, William Bronke and Robert Dempster partnered to purchase the old Frey lot and property owned by, by Matthias Jepson along Main Street. The town of Gardnerville was changing. Bronke built a new theater and two other store spaces on Main Street. Dempster built a two-story building next to the theater. Martha sold her candy and ice cream shop to Mr. Dempster, and it opened next to the Nevada Theater. The Gronke building housed a drugstore on the main floor, as well as offices for attorneys, doctors, and insurance agents upstairs. Two different people contracted in 1920 and then again in 1927 to manage the theater. Sometime in 1927, the building burned. Gronke rebuilt the entire structure, with the theater now having a sloped floor and a stage, as well as a balcony. Once again, in 1937, the building burned and was rebuilt. By that time, Martha and Florence were managing the theater, and high school boys were hired to run the projector. In 1933, Martha had married William Gronke, a widow, widower with two children. The children, Amory and Ethel, were in the care of their maternal grandmother, Settlemeyer. A note from Martha, as she and William honeymooned at Bijou, tells us just how close the sisters were, and I quote, Dear Florence, do not worry, I have not deserted you for William. Love, your sister Martha. <laughs> <laughs> now, a little more about the theater. Early on, Martha was at the ticket window, and Florence wielded the flashlight. She was not above giving a rowdy young man a whack. In later years, several remember Florence at the window with a welcoming smile and often a refusal to take money. It seems she achieved her high school goal of being a friendly businesswoman. My uncle recalls receiving a bundle of tickets to the show as a wedding gift. It was a happy gesture for a young couple with limited means. The Nevada Theater, or the Show House, as it was fondly called, was the social gathering place in the valley for generations. Some memories of the theater include my first movie, different for everyone, of course. Abbott and Costello, The Fly, a Shirley Temple movie or two, then, there was the string hanging down from the light bulb in the middle of the ceiling. Bats flying around made quite an impression. The Kiwanis Halloween costume contest with a parade across the stage, and the talent shows were special times. The advertisements on the screen before the show included the Fielding Hotel in San Francisco and Flowers by Florence. Every generation had kids trying to sneak friends in through the exit door. It usually did not work too well. Martha and Florence took the job of monitoring the young people of this valley seriously. It was not surprising to see a parent arrive to escort a child out. Martha carried sleeping children across the street to the East Fork when the movie was over. 
One thing that never varied through all of the years after the show was over and all of the patrons had gone, it was Martha who carried the canvas money bag with the nickels, dimes, and quarters the block or so home. The sisters had a reputation of being friendly and welcoming into their home. It is likely the parlor in the late 1960s was just as it had been when they were small. I lived across the street from them then, and it was a pleasure to visit in the warm kitchen, the only heated room in the house. They were tolerant of my children running around the neighborhood. The eccentric ladies were frugal with their funds. Undergarments were made of flower sacks, and special occasion dresses or hats were often ordered and then returned after one short wedding. <laughs> Each took risks in several business ventures. And as business women, they made loans to members of the community. The sisters were ahead of their time. It was most unusual for a woman to own a business or property. Martha and Florence set an example for women to be able to make a difference in Carson Valley for years to come. They were successful and sharing in the community. The caring roles reversed in later years as Florence cared for Martha. It seemed impossible to separate these two as they were always together in work, play, life, and in death. Florence died at home in 1972 and Martha soon after in 1973. It is my honor to have presented Martha and Florence Heitman and Martha Heitman Grumpy as women in history. And I have a little footnote. All three, Martha, Florence, and William, all lived to see the theater burn one last time in 1966. <laughs> Esther and her husband Ray have 
organized and led hiking trips for the band load of seniors, to have a nice day out in the fresh air and enjoying our great outdoors. She has planned land trips, such as to Branson, Missouri, and Nashville, and also ocean cruises. Esther and Ray escorted these trips, pushed wheelchairs, looked at and looked up to as many as 50 or more seniors. These excursions made it possible for some people to enjoy a trip they would not have been able to do without their help. As a member of the Senior Center's Young at Heart Club, 20 of them as a board member, Esther has been heavily involved in many of the fundraising projects that provide funds for Meals on Wheels for homebound seniors. The Young and Heart Club's members' fundraising projects have also provided for some of the material needs of the Senior Center. The latest item being a $43,000 walk-in refrigerator freezer for the new Douglas County Senior Center. Yeah. <laughs> Esther has been married to Ray for 25 years, and together they have nine children, 23 grandchildren and 24 great-grandchildren. Wow. <laughs> she received the Governor's Senior Samaritan Award in 1995 and the Sertona Service to Mankind Award in 2011. Esther is a great asset to Douglas County and deserves to be honored in this year's Women's History Remembering Project. Thank you. under 
Knox's watchful eye. Knox is, he'll be 90 this week, and he has his good days and bad days. He couldn't be here today. Uh, my mother made, made, all, made lots of clothes. She made wedding gowns for people in the valley. She made, I remember she made shirts for me. I used to go to school and people would say, the kids would say, where'd you get that shirt? I'd say, oh, my mother made it. <laughs> then later she and Joanna Nelson opened a dress shop on the main street in town. And uh, I think it was next to the Pyrenees. It was called the Century Shop. And she and Joanna selected clothes for women from 1 to 100. Um, she was a great reader, a lifetime member of the Carson Valley Literary Club. She introduced me to the Nevada State Library at a very young age, which I began reading some books that she didn't approve of. Um, I've just recently written a book, sort of in her honor, called Ringo Lessons, 20 Years of Terror in Taos. I'm hoping the museum will carry it in the outlaw section over here. Uh, there's a chapter in there that uh, relates to my old buddy Bill Shaw, who's here in the audience. It's called Doubling Down. Related circumstances of that too. Clark Reed, uh, Bill's brother-in-law, was one of my English teachers in high school, and he certainly is responsible for the better parts of the book. <laughs> uh, after years of lobbying the Douglas County Commissioners in 1966, um, Liz lobbied them and they purchased the site of the Douglas County Library. And they got a grant from the Max C. Fleischmann Foundation for $73,000. They got a federal grant for $43,000 and raised another $17,000. Friends of the library raised it. And they finally built a $130,000 library. She continued her work with the Nevada Council of Libraries and worked to get libraries into the prison system many, in many small towns in Nevada. She was an advocate for bookmobiles and for uh, the lending library system. And then from 1965 through 1973, she devoted so much time to the, to the state. She served as chair of the Douglas County Board of Trustees, the chair of the Nevada Council of Libraries, chair of the Nevada Library Association, and was one of the 12 members of the State Advisory Council. And she served under, uh, consecutively, she was appointed by Governor Grant Sawyer, Governor Paul Laxalt, and Governor Michael Callahan. And I'm sure uh, Governor Laxalt was much more in favor of carrying the good news from my mother, as opposed to Knox, who used to call him up occasionally and give him hell about the water. <laughs> anyway, Liz went on to demonstrate her talents as a visual artist and was one of the original members 35 years ago of the East Fork Art Gallery. She specialized in watercolors depicting old Nevada towns and buildings, <coughs> frequently incorporating historical artifacts into her collages. And uh, some of you may have remembered her sort of faceless Herefords on cards and canvas that are. Uh, found in many homes today. And today, her grandson, Elliot, also displays artistic images of Western Nevada at the East Fort Gallery. Among other awards, Liz was named Woman of the Year by Beta Sigma Phi in 1966 and Library Trustee of the Year in 1967 uh, and the Douglas County Women's Caucus <coughs> in 1980. Uh, another note, she and Knox uh, frequently sponsored a chapter of the Douglas County City Club. It was one of those those great times in our lives when we kids got to run the club, we raised the money for the school bus. Uh, one time, I remember we went to Squaw Valley, and uh, the oldest person on the bus was Tommy Hickey at 18, and the rest of us were, there were about 20 or 30 of us kids, you know. And everybody showed up, nobody got left behind, nobody made trouble. <coughs> um, and, and she and Knox, uh, one time, uh, were chaperones for us to go to Mammoth, and they, my mother was very efficient. She cooked everything, and the whole trip cost us like $30 each for food and, and where we stayed. Um, Liz was a real dynamo of energy in those. She was frequently at the center of activity. She was always quick to recognize the efforts of all her friends and colleagues in what can be seen as a remarkable contribution to the residents of Douglas County and the citizens of Nevada. Uh, she succeeded and was acknowledged for providing a living example to all of us, including her friends and family, and certainly me. So thank you very much.
here to uh, present uh, Nancy Bloody Durbin. And uh, how many people have been inspired by a woman in this audience? What you say? <laughs> Tough question, huh? I was reminded this, this week about my grandmothers who, uh, at their funeral, I thought how many people loved them for their support during the Great Depression and didn't find out about until the funeral. So I kind of became uh, a thought process to uh, help people before they're dead. And then that's part of the reason why I'm promoting Nancy before she's dead. <laughs> I think she deserves all the things in the world that she's, she's promoted our coming. Uh, I also thought about my mother who uh, took care of me and uh, my grandma with a, a brain injury. And when I brought her here, she screamed because our shared and our relatives in the case over there. So if you ever hear a scream, my mom's coming back visiting. <laughs> Uh, right here, right now, uh, Grace Bauer is also one of my heroes. I've tried to uh, help her with the museums the best I can, and the best I can do is with the camera. And as the fate has it, I'm going to do it today. <laughs> um, Grace is a woman in history. I also believe my wife, uh, W. J. Baki, who sacrificed her life savings to fulfill her dream of treating people with pain, is here also. And she's a woman in history. But today, right now, uh, Nancy McDermott is to become a, a woman in history. And for security, I, uh, I was admitting a lot of her family due to the fact that she's still an active political figure, uh, subject to harassment. She's also a very private person, and I'll let her tell the press what she is, what is safe for her to give out. And I do believe she said in amending my speech that she has six adopted grandchildren. And uh, I do believe that she has happy and healthy children and grandchildren, and I'll let her tell you all what she thinks is safe, because that was kind of the line that I went across. Uh, Nancy Broway McDermott was born in Wichita, Texas. She was the eldest of five children. Her education includes a BA in history and government, a master's in public administration. She has been a junior high and a high school teacher of history, civics, and English. That's probably another reason why we get along because my family are all school teachers. <laughs> and I know how hard that is. I met her in 2003 when she was on the Douglas County Planning Commission. And uh, I'm one of those people that videotape meetings. If you ever been to a planning commission meeting uh, during the growth spurt, it was a little bit tough, a little bit tough if you've ever been to one. And then um, two of those years, she was a chairperson and a vice chairperson. So, and I watched her for, those, those are long meetings, and uh, she respected everybody, and uh, everybody had the chance to speak their mind, and I'm still proud of her for that. I saw some terrible things, and I guess you'd have to be there. Uh, there were tough years on that commission. And like I said, the Grove Airport, you name it, she got it. And I watched her handle emotionally charged people for years, long drained meetings, and that's just what I went through. I wonder what she went through. She treated everyone with respect and dignity. And then in 2007, I asked her to give a speech for my wife for this event. And was the thought she, she did is still one of my uh, best moments of my life. I always be thankful for that. And in 2007, she also became a Douglas County Commissioner. Uh, she still is today, 2015. She's been doing the fight for a lot of years for Douglas County, and I'm proud of the way she handles it. She's got to handle the Great Recession. She handles the long hours. The job description is too long to stay here. Uh, Nancy, Nancy does, uh, does not even call it a job. She calls it public service. You know, how many people do public service 10 hours a day for many, many days and many, many years? Just, uh, just a big fan, I guess. Uh, Nancy has a personal touch. I also taped the uh, Tahoe Visual Planning Agency meetings, and back not too long ago, those were also 10 hour meetings, maybe even longer, back and back in Flying Village, Tahoe City. And uh, this year, uh, she gave uh, her fellow board members, board members uh, homemade fruitcake. She made it herself and gave it to you know, people as a gift. And I just thought with other with new board members, that was just a nice touch. It's a personal touch. That's what she does. She's, she's, she listens to people. And I imagine she's done that many times. Um, and like I said, the TRP also has long meetings. And throughout that, she has a lot of homework, of which she, she gets it done. And as someone who films meetings for many years, I can tell when people are faking it. They didn't do their homework. And that can be your life when you show up and someone didn't do their homework. You know? I don't know, it's just amazing. Uh, she's a life member of the Barton Hospital Auxiliary, uh, South Lake Tahoe Cancer League, Douglas County Historical Society, that's a good one. Uh, Douglas County Library, uh, member of the Douglas County Young at Heart, Douglas County Republican Women, Sorosmus International Carson Valley, 
Carson Valley Trails Association, Tahoe Rim Trail Association, uh, Minute Tahoe Sports, <coughs> Minute Tahoe Sports Aviation Foundation, Wounded Warrior Project, and Douglas Wave, uh, Douglas County Cert Team. Is that busy or what? Besides here, <laughs> service to community. It is my honor for all the years of service, uh, Douglas County Commissioner and a champion of many causes. I give you Nancy Broadway McDermott, the woman in history. Thank you. I found out about she got the award I was giving my speech at the uh, uh, Brain Injury Association at, the, at her office, kind of. Yeah, I was crying in the hallway. <laughs> so it, it meant a lot to me, so I do appreciate it. Um, I'm very honored to be uh, with these ladies uh, present and not with us anymore. Hearing their story uh, is very, very touching, very inspirational. Uh, besides my six adopted grandchildren, I also have six grandchildren, three children, and three great-grandchildren. And I'm very happy to say that my son and his sons uh, and their mom are residents of Douglas County and are involved in our community as well. I think this community has a great legacy and I think that um, being a part of that legacy is probably one of the greatest honors. I said when I was growing up, I grew up in Texas, and I lived in Tornado Alley. And we would escape Texas in the summers because of the heat. And we'd go to the mountains in New Mexico or Colorado. And I said, I want to live in the mountains. So I was delighted to move to Tahoe in the 70s. And then I discovered the Carson River Valley. And between our mountain ranges and our valley, we are truly blessed. And so I'm happy to be part of this community and to do everything I can to ensure that it continues in the way that it has, keeping the best that we have as we go forward. Thank you very much. In 1897, Dora Gansberg arrived in Carson Valley and worked 
for the F.C. Nemmer Ranch and for John Danberg at the Sage Ranch. So Henry Margaret Mary Wendell married, and that's when they had these five wonderful daughters, of which my grandmother and, and her grandmother were part of this. So Leola, um, as you can see, organized this. She, she went so far in, um, uh, this was in, she went so far as to organize a parade entry for all of us. And so she talked about all the people, Dennis Bruns being a volunteer, people working at the family operating the Carson Valley Garage, Frank Pierre Gary, a fire department volunteer, operating Perry Dry Goods. So you can see how she loved Carson Valley and she loved that piece of all of that. Uh, she just went on and on. So she has a whole paragraph on every ranch family barter or shopped in Gardeville at the Mercantile or the food store, Rock's Grocery, Capital Dry Goods, Miller's Market, and descendants operated the Millersville, Millerville Hotel. Others worked at the Carson Valley Mark, Valley Insurance, Overland Hotel, Shaw Speed, Joyland Cafe, Jane's Beauty Shop, and Douglas County Schools. So uh, she really knew these people and the part about Leola that I really love is every time you see her, she has a little picture, or in her case, maybe a box picture just now. And she said, do you remember this person? Uh, what did this person, you know, and, and she, as in, when she came back to the valley, she went around to all the elderly people and tried to find out who belonged in that picture and who was missing. And so we have that valuable, valuable legacy of all of those names, and, and we're all looking at them. Well, I don't recognize that person at all. So uh, thank you, Leola, for following, for you know, tracing after all those people that are mostly gone now to find out who was in this picture. Were you in that class with, you know, and all of that? So I know Leola uh, as a thoroughly. Thank you again, Leola, for that. 
She's big on family reunions, and again, she knew those old timers in Carson, in Carson Valley better than anyone. She was always, always getting in the car, taking things for them to identify. In her role as family historian, she was never without her large paper role, but she created the family tree. And it's always with her. And if we ask a question that we that we couldn't answer, out she went to the truck or out she went to the to her little closet and found that roll. Don't you see here is where oh yeah. Yeah. And so she helped us accurately record every birth and uh, funeral. And in a family that was huge with those five sisters and how they married into the valley and spread and cousins. Our, our generation's doing kind of a miserable job of, <laughs> of creating bigger families, but there was a point at which we were related. We felt like we were related to everyone. So another exa great example of her collecting and preserving was evidenced by, by the uh, picture boards that she created for the, about the 4-H camp. Thank you.